Hello everyone, uh, good evening and welcome to the third uh, of our three artists conversations. Um, my name's Richard Brook, uh, I'm a reader in architecture at Manchester School of Architecture. Um, I can see there's a few friends in the audience, so uh, welcome friends uh, and welcome those uh, who are new uh, to us and our work. Um, as I say, this is the third of three conversations that we've convened uh, over the last two weeks. Uh, and this evening we'll be hearing from painter uh, Jen Orpin uh, and author Gareth E. Rees. Um, this is part of a project about the values of the landscapes of post-war infrastructure. Um, and this is the second of a series of four meetings. Uh, we're funded by uh, the Arts and Humanities uh, Research Council, so thanks to them. Um, and we would have done these meetings behind closed doors. Um, however, due to the circumstances, we uh, reformatted and rethought about what we were doing. And I'm really pleased um, that we've put these out into the uh, public domain because uh, your contributions to our discussions have been fantastic. Um, we've really enjoyed uh, hosting the talk. So I think that everyone who's, who's been along so far has had a really interesting time. So we're, we're kind of thrilled um, that you're here and thrilled that um, Gareth, Jen uh, and David, our compere this evening, uh, agreed to join us. Um, I should say thank you also, obviously, to the Modernist Society uh, for hosting us as well. Um, these three conversations were supposed to coincide with a physical exhibition uh, of Jen's paintings, um, which is currently stalled, but will definitely happen in some way at some point in the future as long as Jen doesn't sell all of her paintings, uh, which seems to be going quite well. Um, so uh, in terms of the way we'll proceed this evening, I'll hand over shortly uh, to David. Um, we've got uh, the chat open. So if there's things that you want to say or observe or comment upon or compliment anybody on uh, as we go along, then please uh, feel free to use that chat function. Um, you should also be able to access a Q&A button at the bottom. Uh, and I'd encourage you to put uh, questions for me to put to our panel uh, into the Q&A for our discussion uh, at the close. We'll go for about 40, 45 minutes conversation and then 10 or, 10 or 15 minutes uh, Q&A at the close of proceedings. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand you over to David. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much, Richard. Um, so my name is David Cooper and I teach in the Department of English at Manchester Metropolitan University, where I also co-direct something called the Centre for Place Writing, which is a new research centre at MMU, which is dedicated to the relationship between writing and place. And I guess we've got two main interests. One is sort of the relationship between creative writing and critical or theoretical writing. But another main interest is the relationship between literary writing and other art forms. So it's my enormous pleasure then to be hosting this evening. And thank you, Richard, for the invitation. I'm so excited. In fact, I've actually worn shoes for the occasion. And that's, that's the first time in weeks. That's how excited I am. And um, what I was just going to do to, to begin with, I'll just introduce the um, two artists for this evening. And then I'll just explain a bit more about what's going to happen. So first of all, Jen Orpin graduated from Manchester Metropolitan University in 1996 with a degree in fine arts. She lives in Manchester and joined Rogue Artist Studios in the city in 2000. As well as, ex as exhibiting in various galleries all over the Northwest, selling her patient paintings nationally and internationally, her work has been accepted into several open art exhibitions. She made the long list for the Jackson's Open Painting Prize 2018, 19 and 20, has been a prize winner and has received several commendations. 2018 saw her appear in Sky Arts Landscape Artist of the Year, where the judges chose her in the top three for the heat. In February 2020, she was one of 20 shortlisted artists from a submission entry of 2000 and the first home open exhibition in Manchester. Her paintings have also featured in the last three series of the BBC One drama, Last Tango in Halifax, Ackley Bridge and Russell T Davis's Queer as Folk. She is currently represented by Saul Hay Fine Art Gallery in Manchester. So moving on, born in Germany, brought up in Scotland in the north of England, Gareth E. Rees lived in London for many years before moving to Hastings. His debut novel, Marshland, was published in 2013, and his second book, the autofictional The Stone Tide, appeared in 2018. Gareth's creative non-fiction book, Car Park Life, a portrait of Britain's last urban wilderness, was published to rave reviews in 2019. 
Gareth is also the founder of Unofficial Britain, a website launched in 2014 that offers a platform for writing, art and film that offers unusual perspectives on the landscape and culture of these strange isles. Over the past seven years, contributors to the website have walked through everyday places like car parks, bus stops, factories, alleyways and promenades, only to find that they become weirder the closer they look. With subjects ranging from the mythology of the Thamesmead housing development to memories of animatronic sooty and sweep displays in the Cleethorpes Amusement Arcade. Gareth's latest book, Unofficial Britain, Journeys Through Unexpected Places, was published by Elliot and Thompson last year. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to hand over to um, Jen in a moment. And so Jen's going to talk a bit about her practice. And then we're going to move over to Gareth, who's going to be talking a bit about his own work. And then we'll have sort of a conversation for half an hour or so. And then, as Richard said, then we'll open it up to questions, which will, Richard, Richard will handle. He'll keep a sort of an eye on the questions and answers at the bottom of the screen. So, um, yeah, my, I'll hand over to Jen. Thanks for that, uh, David. Um, hi, everyone. So, um, as, uh, as David said, I've been uh, living and uh, working in Manchester for uh, since 19, 1993. Um, so I'm a landscape painter. I uh, I've painted all different kinds of landscapes from West Highlands of Scotland to uh, the kind of urban gritty streets of Gorton and Openshaw where my, sh my studio is. Um, I've predominantly though painted roads and mo empty, empty roads and motorways um, throughout the last I'd say since late 2017 and 18 they've kind of been a subject, it's been a subject matter that's popped up um, pretty consistently really and I've been painting them most consistently over the last year um, and I guess it kind of came into my practice because of a, a motorway journey that I made uh, late 2015. I spent a lot of time on, on the road uh, over, over the space of about three months. Uh, my dad had a stroke and my family lived down in, in Surrey um, my dad had a stroke and ended up in a hospital down there in an IC unit, unit. So for three months every week, I drove from Manchester down there. So M6, M42, M40, M25. Uh, and it kind of became my, I made 95% of the time I made those journeys on my own. So it was a very stressful, strange and uh, emotionally charged time. But it was also time for, uh, being on my own and a time for reflection. And I don't think I've ever spent that amount of time in a car on my own ever before. Um, so uh, one of the major, well, there's many landmarks along the way, but one of the main landmarks was the, the uh, uh, line railway bridge. It's a cable stayed uh, railway bridge just off on the M25, just before junction 12. And that became a major landmark for me. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's a, an amazing bridge. Uh, it was one of the first um, all concrete uh, state bridges made in the world, uh, built in about nine, built in 1978. Um, and it's just, it's massive. And kind of every time I went under it, I knew I had about 10 minutes to go before I got, you know, walked through the hospital doors. Unfortunately, we lost my dad just before Christmas 2015. But I guess every time I went, made that journey, uh, it kind of sparked those memories and all the emotions around that. Uh, so it was about two years it took me to actually sort of put paintbrush to canvas to paint uh, these, start painting these images um, from that from that journey uh, to begin with. Um, so from there, I just sort of, uh, I'd say chipped away at it basically and uh, it's popped up and but yeah like I say in the last year it, I've predominantly been painting empty empty rows and motorways um, and that's been my major theme really um, and it's been really interesting taking part in this this particular project because I got, I've got to I've started to read Gareth's book and um, you know his experience of motorways has been really interesting to find a connection um, so that's kind of a bit about my practice, really. So, yeah. OK, Gareth. Yeah, for me, it all began uh, in Hackney, I suppose, um, in about 20, no, 2008, I think it was. Um, we, I, we moved to Clapton and I started wandering through the Lee Valley, uh, which is a strange semi-industrial edge land between Hackney and Walthamstow um with the, with the canals and old victorian railway bridges and 
sort of ancient bits of land that had not been touched since the ice age or mixed in together in a kind of weird jumble um there was a, a, a railway arch where the first british airplane was built and flown across the marsh and there was all kinds of rumors of phantom bears uh when you worked, walked out there on a sunday morning you could hear raves happening in the sides of the reservoir uh and there were all kinds of strange characters mixing around in this what a, a kind of a kind of nether region and a, a vaguely disputed weird area of london that no one seemed to particularly own particularly at that time um so i became really interested in that but what really interested me was the narrative fertility of of the of the old infrastructure that existed there so where victorian bridges intersected with ancient marshland or where the old victorian reservoir the old filter beds had been allowed to be overcome with nature these were exciting places and i began to i began to get this idea about how sort of folklore and uh, imagination spring from things that were originally industrial and carbuncles maybe were protested like the railways that cut through the marshes uh, but yet that had become almost uh, mythic, uh, fantastical, beautiful, attractive and mysterious places that people would walk and where I would just come up with lots of different kind of stories. So I started to write lots of weird fiction based in these places and it all became Marshland, which was my first book. Um, I was particularly interested in things like electricity pylons and, and how people can get maybe attached to them. Uh, I became attached to one particular electricity pylon that was in the old filter beds that had a real dominance over the scene and was separate somehow from the other pylons and I began to think about how something so uniform and mundane could take on its own personality. Um, when I left Hackney I moved to Hastings and I started to kind of do the same thing then I was trying to write a, an, a, a, an occult psychogeography of Hastings so a lot of a lot of occultists have moved down there most famous Alistair Crowley but lots of other ones as well and writers and strange people have drifted down from Britain, almost like settling at the bottom of the country in Hastings. So I tried to do that, but what I ended up doing was getting caught up in the vortex of Hastings' strange stories and mysteries. Uh, and my life started to go a bit wrong at the same time. So it became what you call an autofictional novel, uh, which is basically my way of saying, yeah, most of this is true, but it's uh, so weird, I had to say it was a novel. And I became obsessed with certain things in the town, although it's, it's, it's quite a rural place with cliffs, and, and the sea, there was also this strange urban element to it that I was interested in. For example, the myth of Crowley's curse, which apparently doomed the town after he died in 1947. I like this idea that you can have these contemporary legends and contemporary myths in urban areas that kind of explain a lot of the political and economical problems that Hastings had. A lot of its decline was kind of linked in with this curse of Crowley, which never probably actually existed because he liked the town and it was always a bit of an urban legend. As I was sort of wandering around Hastings in my reveries, I quite by accident started to explore supermarket car parks as you do. Uh, it basically was a Morrison's at the bottom of my road. And one night I was drunk and I started to wander around the Morrison's and it seemed as interesting as a place as I'd been before. I just thought, well, let's, let's explore it. So I started to sort of poke around. There were all kinds of weird things there. There was a Mercedes, crash Mercedes that had the number plate 1066, which was kind of strange in Hastings. There were odd characters lurking. There was, there was lots of life there. You could hear these strange clangs and bangs, but there was also a fox in the petrol forecourt. There was some teenagers getting stoned. There were some kind of lanky geezers in the corner just sort of staring at me. A car inexplicably drove in through the access ramp with a guy sort of with his eyes lit up like a cat's with a kind of baseball cap on. And he just went to this part of the car park and stayed there. So so I began to think, well, if this place is interesting, then are all car parks interesting? And that's when I started my journey through Britain, um, which became car park life, looking at these, not even the brutalist structures like uh, multi-stories. It was really about those edge, those bits of edges of inner towns, places that you just walk through every day, maybe as a shortcut, or just the bits of the car park you'd never think to go because you're too busy with your shopping. Um, and that was what kind of started the, the route towards the book Unofficial Britain and towards the stuff I'm going to talk about with Jen today, because as I was sort of looking at thinking about car parks and structures, sort of commercial structures and functional structures like that, I began to think about loads of other stuff as well, about roundabouts and ring roads and other sort of mundane places that people kind of uh, think have, have destroyed the culture of Britain and are to blame for a lot of the loss of, of the beauty in this in this country and uh, I began to think, well, maybe they haven't been so much to blame in the sense that human beings adapt and we grow and we think about these places and they become embroiled and embraced by our experiences. So that's what I set out to kind of look at. So I went through Britain on a series of journeys, trying to just think about how 
myth and storytelling and memory have become attached to places that we might think of as, as, as edited out, but not really important to car parks and power stations, and electricity pylons, uh, and in particular roads. So there was, there's, there's ring roads and roundabouts and um, the motorway, the M6 in particular, uh, and also flyovers and bridges. So just before, just to kick everything off, I guess, um, I'm going to do a quick reading which uh, about the motorway from the motorway chapter that I think will sort of set the scene for the discussion. <clears throat> okay. The M6 came into my life at the end of my second year in primary school when my family moved from Kirkentillich to Glossop. Of course, I didn't realise it was the M6 at the time. What child ever looks at road maps or considers the number of the road? You just clamber into the car and enjoy or endure the ride. For me, it was simply the motorway, a high speed conduit that took us to England through Carlisle, uh, Preston and Manchester. For the rest of my childhood, it became the route back north to family in the holidays. On those trips, after the initial thrill had drained away, my brother and I would resign ourselves to the passing hours Mum's Gene Pitney cassette would be playing or dad's mixtape mix tape of hits from the 70s and 60s. My brother and I chiming in on the tracks that we knew. And occasionally we perform puppet shows in the back window or bicker over who was encroaching on whose seat. But mostly I'd stare out at the scenery rushing past, enthralled by the rhythm of flickering pylons, bridges and street lamps. After dark, electric beams of lights would slice their way through the car interior in hypnotic tones of orange and yellow, lulling me into a trance. If we were lucky, dad would pull into a service station, places that had something otherworldly about them, like restaurants in space, where burgers came with a carousel of sauces and the bags of sweets were gigantic. When I was 16, my dad got a new job in Stafford and we moved to Shropshire. The M6 now formed the majority of our route to Scotland, further embedding itself in my consciousness. It became a mental holloway, seared into my neural networks through sheer repetition which is why it remains the one road that gives me a true sense of belonging, even though I've lived in the south of England for 20 years. On those rare occasions now, when I drive up the M6 to Glasgow with my two daughters, they become me and my brother in the back seat, asking if we're nearly there yet, while I and my father saying no and turning up the volume on the stereo. The M6 is not only where it began for me, but for all motorways in Britain. It was the first one to open, beginning life as the Preston Bypass, a concept sketched out in the 1930s by James Drake, the Lancashire County Surveyor, pioneer of our national motorway network. It wasn't until December 1958 that it was opened by Harold Macmillan. A few years later came the Lancaster Bypass, followed in 1963 by the section running to Birmingham. And when the northernmost stretch to Carlisle opened in 1970, the M6, as we know it, was born. It snakes up through the Midlands to the northwest, through cityscapes, industrial estates, retail parks, farms, forests and mountains, until it hits Gretna Green on the Scottish border, where it transforms into the M74. There have been plans to name the entire motorway on either side of the border, the M6, but such proposals meet with resistance from those who believe that its upper reaches should remain the M74 to maintain its Scottish identity. And this goes to show that while the tarmac may be monochrome and monotonous, motorways can have a distinct cultural history, hewed as they are into a land of extant national borders, idiosyncratic natural features and historical sites, many of which determine its root and shape. They manifest in urban communities as bridges, underpass and flyovers, which have political and social effects in those places, creating weird new spaces for crime, art and hedonism. The motorway is more than the object itself too. It is the view it gives you of the topography and the architecture through which it passes, the service stations you stop at, the exit signs that once led you to the homes of lovers, friends or family members long gone from your life, slip roads to the sites of holidays, weddings and parties in your formative years. A motorway is a conduit for dramas, whether they take place in the car or at the end of the journey, or that time you argued with your partner, hitchhiked to a festival or broke down on a wintry night. If it were possible to manifest all of the significant life moments that have occurred on a single stretch of motorway, I imagine there'd be an ectoplasmic cavalcade of crashes, prangs, pranks and arguments, sing-alongs, shock revelations, terror, rage and laughter. Over thank to you very you. much. Yeah, thank, thank you very much both for those sort of brilliant introductions. Um, and whilst you were both talking, I was sort of thinking about um, a sort of a term which um, also Helen and um, Kevin discussed in the sort of brilliant discussion last Thursday and this was sort of um, ideas of nostalgia which I think would sort of 
that could be maybe seen in both of your work. So I just, oops, I just wondered as a starting point, um, just wonder whether you could say a bit more away about the way in which you might, in your own practice, you frame motorways as sites of nostalgia. Jen, I just wondered whether you could go yeah. first with that. Yeah, I mean, for me, the, they play um, nostalgia plays a, a massive role, really. Um, it's and I and I get a lot of and the reason why I say it's because I get a lot of people's response to my work, and it's the thing that they, they pick up the most um, when they look at when they look at my paintings. It it kind of sparks memories, it um, kind of relationships, uh, you know, love, loss, and it. You know, and also those feelings that, you know, Gareth just touched on that. Uh, I mean, for me, certainly when I was, uh, you know, I have memories of my dad bundling us in the back of a car, uh, you know, really early in the morning to get on the road to miss the traffic, um, you know, to go on holiday. We used to travel from uh, Surrey up to Sunderland. So it's a bit of a trek. But uh, yeah, used to, used to, we all used to, you know, roll around in the back seat, no, no, you know, um, seat belts or anything. And, uh, and so it kind of, the work is sort of tapping into that and that's a, the, the sort of theme I think that comes out back to people and they can relate to that um, uh, and you know it's certainly something for me that like I say people uh, I've got a couple of things that people have written to me um, you know when they it's, it's the main thing that people talk about actually um, is, is their relationship to the past when they look at the paintings and when they think about roads and when they think about motorways or certain landmarks, you know, people say, oh, you know, when, when every time we go under a bridge, we all, we, we all used to say this word at the same time, you know, the first person to spot this particular landmark or, you know, the water tower on the, on the M40 or the, you know, and I, that's sort of the first lead in that people say to me when they talk about nostalgia with, in relation to my, my paintings. So if it's okay, I just, I'm gonna read out a couple of emails that I've sent. Um, this is from Diane, and this is relating to a bridge too far. I think, Evan, we've got an image of a bridge too far. Uh, that's it. Uh, so uh, this lovely lady, she um, bought this painting from me event, uh, in, in the end, but she came across it in an exhibition I had up in um, Westmoreland, up in the, up in the lakes. Uh, so she uh, entered into a correspondence with me, and she um, asked about the painting. So she said, thanks very much for getting back to me. I was on holiday in the lakes, but I live in Nottingham. I saw your painting in the exhibition and haven't been able to forget about it since. I stood looking at it, crying at the same time. It completely struck a chord with me. My dad worked on building bridges on the M6. He was a foreman steel mixer. I was born in Stoke and we often used, used to visit Kiel services for a trip out when I, was, when I was a child. My dad died a few years ago, but my mum has just moved into a nursing home and we have sold a house in the Stoke area. It wasn't my childhood home as they downsized. I had to empty the house and go through everything, old photos, documents and ornaments. Your painting and what you'd writ written about it just summarises everything I'm feeling right now. All those journeys taken and all those yet to come. Memories from the past, but also what's happening now and what lies ahead in the future. I was totally transfixed as I looked at it. It brought so many emotions to the surface. I didn't even know there. Thank you very much. So, you know, that, that then brings, for me, it's really important that that nostalgia kind of connects me to that person because actually you know most of the I've got another I've got another one as well um most of uh, the emails I get actually are about people dying <laughs> which is a bit bleak. <laughs> but no not just about dying but um you know it's uh, there's another one here this is from um uh this is from Nick uh so he says firstly thanks for sending the barcode road piece it's a very nostalgic painting as I spent so much of my youth driving on motorways around South Manchester on the way to school or in the back of my parents' car, going to friends, visit friends, running errands into town, etc. I lived in, I've lived in London now for over 25 years uh, and with short periods abroad, it's funny how little time I spend on motorways comparatively and how much I now associate them with my youth. I was up a lot a couple of years ago as my mum was terminally ill at Christie's Hospital and those motorways came back into my life with a sense of claustrophobia again. Those childhood feelings came back to me. I guess motorways are about freedom in a way, but for me, a lot of it is about being cooped up in cars, being taken places I didn't really want to go to, always reliant on cars driven by adults. The edges of your paintings remind me of old watercolours my gran used to have in her house, bad paintings of canals and landscapes, nostalgic and jarring with the more modern images of motorway motorways themselves today. So just every time, you know, people respond to, to uh, the, the roads and the motorways and those images in that kind of way and I, you know it's for me it's been a, a really sort of beautiful experience really getting to know people and people sharing their stories with me and 
and uh, their memories um, of their families and stuff. So, yeah, that's it's nostalgia is pretty important for me, really, with, with regards to my work and what it what it says to people. Over to you, Gary. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's, that, that was definitely a thread that I looked at as well, as you can tell from that reading. One other, th but just to add to this something different, uh, I think there's also a collective nostalgia um, bound up with motorways. Uh, when I was writing the book, uh, one, of my, one of the things I was looking at as I was writing the motorway chapter was uh, Martin Parr's boring postcards and looking at the images of uh, the motorway in the sort of halcyon opening days, where you've got these incredible clean lines and these luxurious restaurants in space and this kind of aspirational uh, post-war boom, baby boomer kind of environment. And the motorways were everything um, with that. You know, you even had Jane Mansfield opening the Chiswick flyover. You know, there was, there was a kind of glamour to them. And it was, it, was a, it was a kind of future that was promised to everyone. And... I think that kind of motorway and those early service, service stations, even up into the early 80s, are kind of embedded in our, we're going to talk about Fortin later on, but they're these kind of iconic towers towering over the motorway. These, these things never really transpired because unfortunately, uh, global warming and uh, or the, the, the pollution and pandemics and whatever else has happened since has kind of, kind of means that future that we thought was going to happen, delivered to us by the automobile, hasn't really transpired. And I think we do look back on those early motorways with a certain fondness and those, the popularity of things like Martin Parr's boring postcards and the popularity still when you show people kind of glossy, lovely old images of the, of the motorways with the, hardly any cars there, like you say, in the, the luxuriously decorated restaurants. I think we look back at that as a, as a time of innocence and hope. And I think now the motorway is a very busy, gnarly place that uh, has kind of grown old and crumbling. And I think whenever we go on these motorways, I think we're aware of it. However, there's also something really reassuring about the motorway experience that no matter what has happened to the life as we know it, there are certain times when you pull off the motorway into a service station at night with the big glowing lights. That's something that takes you back to childhood. Yeah. Um, so I think that I think collectively we all have a memory of motorways that's quite um, that's important. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. And I think what you were saying then um, sort of about nostalgia, I was, I was thinking the, the sort of nostalgic elements, and there seems to be me anyway, a sort of an interest on in nostalgia and both of your work in a sort of different way. But it also thinks it seems to be like destabilized for me by a sort of certain like uncanniness or strangeness in your work. So like Jen, the fact that we've got motorways, but there's no cars on it. Yeah. And and yeah, and Gareth, you seem to sort of go, go in search of the strange. So I just wondered how the sort of that idea of sort of motorways or sort of sites of nostalgia and motorway as motorways as sites of strangeness, how they relate to one another. For me, I guess it's um, it's not really. It, they may come across as slightly eerie uh, or sort of strange, as you say. You know, with the lack of cars and people. And, and you know, I, I work from uh, images, phot photograph, Im photographic images to start off with. And obviously, all the roads I pretty much take photographs of have traffic in them and I take the traffic out. And it's mm. it's not really as sinister as that, I guess. Um, it's, it's as simple as, um, I don't want to add a narrative to my paintings. I don't want the viewer to look at the painting and see a car or a person and think about that person's journey. Where's that person? Where's that car going? I want the viewer to, I want the viewer to own the narrative. So for me, it's important not to have any added um, story in it apart from the open road, as it were. So you can make your own journey. It's your journey. It's, it's your sort of... Um, I guess that's quite romantic really in a way but uh it's it, you it's your relationship with that with that road and and that landmark whatever it is which, whichever um painting you're looking at you know mine so so that's so yeah it's not as it's it's not meant to be a sort of um eerie or that although they do come across sometimes like that uh it's not as sinister as that for me really it's as, it's as simple as you know i want it to be about the person looking at the work it's about their their experience of that and and nothing else to interfere with that really i guess yeah uh, my uh what well, if there's a thread in my writing it's that everything is weird when you start to look at it closely and so uh I, most of my practice i guess if you call it that is to go up to things very closely and to dwell in them to basically psychogeography i suppose it's 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 walking and dwelling in places and looking really into the micro detail and as soon as you do that shopping centers and car parks and motorways become really really strange um so i spent two days on the m6 just decided to stay on it and just not leave it and just keep going up and down and staying in service stations and it, it 
it, it's a weird feeling you because you become completely detached from a kind of reality you knew and so what sort of a motorway land with motorway laws and weird kind of motorway sort of etiquette where even from the part when you're driving the kind of unspoken things of drivers as you're driving along the conversations that you kind of have with vehicles the kind of rage and the, the sort of surprises you have while driving but also the service stations themselves so I stayed in a days in hotel and it was like the shining with the carpet going on for ages and the empty corridors and there was these weird pieces of art that all were exactly the same. There were just this certain, with every, every time I went along about three or four doors, there was another piece of art that was the same uh, as if it was trying to trick me into some kind of time loop. So uh, as I began to kind of look really closely at these things on the motorway, I felt like I was out of time and that I was in a, in a looping reality that was a little bit like the reality I knew, but wasn't um, possibly just the madness of being for two days on your own in a car. But um, the motorway is a strange place because you exist on it but then if you just walk to the edge of a motorway service station car park there's quite often the countryside and it opens up like a like a fantastical dream a kind of misty memory of an ancient England uh, and you sometimes forget that when you're traveling quickly with your family or your friends on the motorway you stop at service stations then you get back on the motorway you forget that actually the, the other world is still there existing like in a parallel dimension uh, which I found really strange. That was one of the things I noticed doing walks around car parks of service stations was I just thought I had never really considered the bit just outside of the fence before. Yeah, neither had I actually. And, and I'd love that bit in your book when I read it. And I also love the bit in your book, Gareth, when you said that when, you, when you're on the motorway, you know, you have to, do, you know, follow the motorway rules as it were. And, and as soon as you, you know, uh, hit the slip road, uh, you're released from the motorway's contract. And I love that bit in your book about, about, you know, as soon as you, well, as soon as you step into the car, obviously you enter into a contract, but you know, as soon as you got on the road, you enter into a contract and uh, you know, you adhere to the, the rules of that contract. And, you know, I really like that bit in your book. It's almost a bit like the, when you're on the motorway, you're in a building, you're on a specific yeah. structure. You forget, yeah. you always think the road is a thing that, leaves, but it's actually a thing and it has, and it, even on the motorway, it's even more extreme because it has its different laws to outside. And yeah. there's even that sign with a cross saying the motorway laws have ended. I, as a kid, I used to think, what does that mean? I didn't really understand. <laughs> um, and the service stations try and stop you from understanding the outside world. So they deliberately seal off mm. the country. They don't want people stopping at service stations and tramping into the field yeah. up tent or yeah. going to the local pub and yeah. having a pint they they want you to spend that money in burger king and whatever so there's a kind of, it's it's you're very much it's, it's capitalism in a big long corridor through the m6 and all the kind of strange foibles of capitalism i discovered in car park life are kind of there as well it's like one long big moving car park and that's depressing in some ways but also fascinating and we do whether we like it or not that's that's been our all of us alive pretty much have had this experience I think you just talking about that sort of the sort of most ways sort of capitalist spaces. I think I'll ask this, this question now, and this is my chair's prerogative. As someone who lives in Lancaster, fought and sort of figures like quite prominently in our geographical imagination. But and if someone's interested in the role that fought and plays in both your works, and um, and but I notice in um, unofficial Britain, Gareth, you this sort of, you obviously sort of think about fought and and go to fought and spend time there. But I think um, you sort of, my reason got a bit, you sort of slightly worry as well, whether it's been maybe overdetermined, whether it's been represented too much. So I just wondered whether you could say a bit more, a bit about the way that Fortin figures in your work. Well, Fortin is the iconic uh, tower, really, of, of, the, of, the, of the motorway. It's the, it's the most famous, I would think, uh, visually at least, or at a glance uh, service station. And, and of course, it's, it's, it's an amazing bit. It's amazing. And I'm not surprised that it's had people taking photographs of it and it's all over Instagram and artworks being made but for the, what in official Britain but what it was about was I was going if wherever that wherever something becomes the main focus my job was to kind of look at the edge of that mm -hmm. so if if the tower is really popular it's almost become official Britain it's almost a thing that maybe that would become part of the so I would rather go and sort of see if there's anything weird about you know the toilets or the where, where the truck stop so which is what I did so I I thought well that's the tower and I can write about it but you know that uh, maybe it's been said so I kind of started meandering around and there's a bit below Fortin services there's a CB radio salesman called Brian Crompton who's been there since Valentine's Day in 1990 originally used to drive a van up there and then eventually was in the where the garage is where the truck uh, petrol filling station is and then eventually he moved to this, this little sort of pre it's a really old looking prefab it's got fax machine written across the top it's like a it's like a sort of new version of the TARDIS. You know, it's this weird sort of, it's like, feels like it's the disguise for something else. And he's in there with all his, he's got like soft toys that he picks up when, when kids leave toys in the car park, he picks them up and collects them in case anyone wants to find them. And uh, there's been sort of little films made about him. So that was one 
the thing that I found. And then as I sort of skirted around the perimeter, I don't know if there's a, if there should be a photo um, of this. As I kind of went around the ed edges of the car park behind the filling station, I found a kind of another structure, which was a, a enclosure, a wire enclosure within it, like concrete blocks, like a concrete henge. Uh, with steps kind of going to nowhere and it had been really deliberately sealed off there was barbed wire to stop people getting in or out it was locked and it was just kind of a way on the on the perimeter and I kind of thought this is a structure that's strange because I, I put on Twitter does anyone know what this is there was no answer people saying well it's probably something that was a structure that was left for something that was being built and was taken away but it was in a really weird bit right near the trees right next to a field full of pylons and I thought this is a great and inexplicable object it's kind of there's a Japanese guy who calls it hyperfiction. It's objects that have been built for a purpose, but then have lost their purpose and become strange object they are, I guess. Um, so I thought, well, this is probably more interesting to write about than Forton Tower, because here, here in the kind of tumble down edges, you find something that's just genuinely weird. Mm -hmm. uh, and then as I, as I went around to the other far side of Forton, normally there's barriers stopping you from going into the countryside. And Forton is a tiny little desire path and I was in a country lane and there was a smell of sh sort of sheep shit and there was farm buildings and a little car came tootling around like a little hatchback, like it was some guy from the 1950s appearing and just, it was really weird. And I walked up and down this crunching on the leaves thinking I'm now not in the motorway. I mean, I felt like I'd transgressed. I'd gone into a different realm. I'd traveled back in time and uh, which is a weird thing to feel on a journey in the M6. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, yeah, it, it is kind of, the rock star of the service station world, I think, Fulton, and and I and um, I have I'm going to in the spirit of transparency, I'm going to admit that I have never actually been in to Fulton services, um, only driven past and under. I have painted it, I think, four times. One once was a commission, uh, and the other three, I think, were di you know different viewpoints and angles. And, and needless to say, every single one of those sold kind of within very a short amount of time because uh, people just love it and you know um and that's kind of the response i i've got from it really is that they just it, it again it's that nost nostalgia thing and it conjures up uh, memories of, of childhood journeys and stuff um and you know i i haven't painted it since last year or the year before but uh it's a pain to paint <laughs> so um architecturally it's a pain to paint but uh I, yeah it's, it's 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 very popular and i think since reading your section on on the fortin in, in your book gareth i am eager to now i'm going next time i'm allowed to get on the road i'm going to travel north and go in and visit the service station as opposed to just driving past it um who knows i might take some photographs from underneath it or whatever and around it and, and use them in in future work but uh, I, yeah, like I said, I've painted it four times now and I'm kind of, a, I feel like I'm done with it. Uh, I don't know if it's been over um, used or like Gav said, in, you know, it, it appears a, a lot on Instagram and stuff and, and photographs and artists, you know, use it as a, as a muse regularly. But um, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it, I mean, I, I remember the first time I drove under it, I got goosebumps. Um, and there's, there is something magical about it, but I'm, yeah, I'm definitely, since reading that chapter in your, in your book, Gareth, eager to go and have a look around, uh, it's, you know, it's ground. So, sorry, my, my light, which is next to me, seems to be having some sort of fit, so apologies for that. Um, yeah, it's a, no, I'm really interested to sort of as a Lancastrian resident and, and, and what you're saying about the, about Fulton and then, like, yeah, get what Gareth was saying then about it, when I was reading the book, the way in which, Gareth, you read Fortin as being embedded within like the local rural landscape as well as being sort of alongside the M6. And I think that I think that, that is fascinating. Obviously, we've talked a lot about motorways and that's that's sort of common trope in your work, but I noticed that roundabouts also sort of figure quite prominently. And I just noticed in the chat that some people were talking about the way in which the, the sort of the, the way we can see motorways in sort of allegorical terms or think about them sort of narratives. So we've got a different type of narrative maybe with the, the motorway to a roundabout. So I just wondered what if you could say a bit about the way your sort of interest in roundabouts. Jen, do you want to sort of kick off? Well, I was going to say my, my roundabout journey is kind of uh, only just begun really because it's mm -hmm. it's been, um, I don't have any images uh, to show, but I, over the last <clears throat> six months or so, uh, I've been painting uh, the underpass, and I know Gareth has done uh, has written a section in his book about uh, you know roundabouts and, and underpasses and flyovers, 
Um, we've got just down the road from me here is the Mancunian Way. Um, and uh, there's a um, roundabout there. I mean, I, I refer to it as a Medlock roundabout. And I've lived here in Hume for 20 years, I'd say, um, long, a bit longer. And I did the first year of my degree. Uh, the Manchester Metropolitan University Art Department was in a little sort of office kind of style building just off Medlock roundabout. And I realised that it, it come up to me living here for about 20 years. And I thought, God, you know, that's I'm going to go down and take some photographs around under that um, underpass. And it's. Uh, a place where people, you know, walk through and under all the time, but it's full of graffiti. And uh, what happened through the last lockdown is kind of with a lack of pollution and cars driving around it, it felt like the uh, na like, like nature kind of almost reclaimed the, the area. The grass and the wildflowers are growing, trees seem to have more leaves on them. Um, and it was became this kind of place of beauty, really. So I, um, started a series of paintings really looking at that detail and the and you know the walls and, and Gareth writes about this in his book about the artwork in underpasses and and uh, under fly flyovers and how it's used as a place for people to to meet and uh you know there's this whole world going on down there so that's kind of my it's kind of a relatively new thing for me it's just it's just a body of work I've started to have started to explore and I've mainly based it on the Medlock roundabout down there and it's you know, again, I've had people talk to me about how they used to go nightclub and walk back through there and how they used to walk there through there, you know, memories of, you know, 20, 30 years ago and how it's kind of never changed really. And there's been a lot of redevelopment here recently on the, the other roundabout further up. And that is not how it used to be anymore. They've kind of flattened it and put on all these like different roads and stuff. And, and you know, I don't know how long this is going to stay as it is, you know, it's, it's been like that since, you know, the, the Mancunian way was built. Um, so that's kind of uh, my experience really of roundabouts. It's a, it's a relatively new one. So uh, I know Gareth, you spent quite a bit of time under a few of those I can see from your book. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, roundabouts were a bit of a surprise really for me. They, they came into my life all of a sudden. <laughs> I think when I was in car park life, so <laughs> I became obsessed with the, the Bristol uh, Cribs uh, Causeway Retail Park has a sort of standing stone like thus Stakes Darasustra comes as on as you kind of drive past it. It's this huge stone silhouetted against the light. Uh, it's got another roundabout in, in, a little bit further in that's basically a, mass, a massive like 1990s Madonna cone bra type effect with a cone nipple at the top. When I was when I was writing about that, someone in my on, on official Britain said, "Do you know they're all erogenous zones? Because there's another one that's a vulva and there's another one that's an anus. So there's like this mm -hmm. sort of strange anatomical um, cultish thing going on, sort of secret coding in Bristol Causeway." And when I started to look even deeper into it, I realised that there's a, there's a lot more to roundabouts. For example, there's a, a guy called Stuart Silver who I walked with um, in, in Glasgow. And he's an urban druid and he he suggests that roundabouts should be placed by druids they should be the people who talk to the council because basically roundabouts these control the energy around a town and they're kind of got the kind of pagan potential he doesn't believe pagans should go off somewhere green and for a weekend he thinks people should they should practice magic using the urban structures that exist and particular roundabouts also in glasgow a guy called kenneth brophy uh the urban prehistorian he looks at roundabouts as legitimate field targets for archaeology a lot of them are on points of interest but also you know like so if there are a lot of digs happen at roundabouts and a lot of roundabouts when they're created dig up the history that and they get analyzed and then suddenly you have a roundabout but also roundabouts themselves maintain some of that um power that maybe stone circles and neolithic sites do in the way that they channel uh, the, 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 that people kind of approach them and how they they capture local identity in them that's why there's lots of statues and sculptures and features on roundabouts these days particularly new ones and so as I kind of started to explore them, I realized that the roundabouts are probably more important than people think to their, to their culture. And, uh, and there's also just bizarre sort of urban myths about round, roundabouts, like apparently Telford's roundabouts were basically the designers, the planners were having a meeting and it went on for ages and they were having cups of coffee and the circular remnants of their coffee mugs created these and that was where they put the roundabouts because someone thought that was a deliberate design so that's an urban led you know so there was just loads of stuff about roundabouts that you wouldn't really think um and then actually exploring them on foot they're even more interesting uh, like jen was saying when you actually get 
into roundabouts where they they are connected with larger roads, so your underpasses, and they become like stone monuments. You know, they've got these great ch sort of uh, chambers going into the centre, and in some of them, I found ritualistic objects. Uh, so in Bristol, I found a doll with flowers over the motorway in the middle of a roundabout on the M32 um, left there. I found a shrine that had like nuts and seeds in it and symbols daubed all over it. So it feels like people engage with these things in a, in a way that's not just about getting from A to B really quickly. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the, the Medlock roundabout has uh, up there has these huge big pillars and they are used as sort of canvases really for, for graffiti artists and artists. And and it, looking at it from various viewpoints, it's like with the Mancunian way above, it's sort of in concrete blocks and it's almost, and below that, these, these concrete pillars are on these um, sort of crazy paving mounds. And it's almost like a, um, a snake on the back of a reptile of some, just some sort. It, and it sort of sweeps around and curves and it's, it's quite, it's, it is really organic actually. And you know, again, that ties in with the, the organic nature of nature that's sort of around it. So yeah, they're, they're like sort of other worlds. Whilst you've been talking, I just jotted down a few words that you're just using sort of um, over the course of this evening. It was like, terms like belonging, memory, obviously we've talked about a lot, nostalgia, ideas of attachment. And so, what seems to be coming through is this sort of sense of like whether we talk about motorways or um, sort of roundabouts or these sites that you're sort of both interested in you've seen them both as places rather than non-places and like the, that um, term used by Mark Auger is that is that fair to say then that you see see these sites as places rather than non-places definitely I think they're definitely places uh, I mean even when you're traveling along a motorway you're in a even though you're moving kind of in a place it's a place of uh, I think it says, it's a place of joy, it's a place of sadness, it's a place, place of fun, it's conversations, you're, you're having, you're in something as you're moving, whether you're sort of on your own or with somebody, you know, and, and I think, uh, you know, they're, yeah, they're definitely, definitely places as opposed to non-places and, and also think places, obviously roundabouts and stuff and underpasses and they've got their own uh, sort of life going on in them. Uh, people use them for so many different sort of reasons, um, whether they're just walking through or they go there to do something. Uh, so, yeah, I think fundamentally um, they are places for me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think I think some of the um, some of the structures of sort of super modernity that some of these Ballardian structures that, yeah. uh, that originally did have this sort of timeless non-cultural feel where people could be anywhere at any time and would associate from any culture and landscape. I think that was very much true, but these places have really become worn and, and crumbling and uh, overgrown with weeds and, and memories and, and folklore and, mm -hmm. and artworks and embedded in so many, so many cycles of life and death have happened that I think that they've, they, they've changed. So that may be still true of an airport, for example, but I'm not sure it's mm -hmm. true of like the M M6 or particularly in the book, I was interested in where, I didn't want to write an Edgelands book. So I was very interested in where these things intersected. So like in Port Talbot, it's amazing where the M4 is on stilts at the back of the of the of the town, and it has this amazing flyover that comes over a, a grave of Dick Pender in the um, Welsh rebel, and it, it kind of cuts through a graveyard, and the graveyard's actually fused with the side of the flyover, so that it's the wall of the flyover is also the wall of the graveyard, and the people there had to kind of renegotiate their lives based on this this place. There's incredible artworks there, and and weird artwork stuff like Egyptian cats and the eye of Horus and kind of mystical kind of structures and the mystical paintings and also a weird obelisk that is built in memory of the houses that the flyover got rid of so there's this map on a plinth of what came before so the, this is very much not a, a some non-place where you couldn't be anywhere else you couldn't be anywhere else but Port Talbot and and that is just that one piece of flyover. And it seemed to be the same story whether I was in Bristol or, or wherever I went on my, on my journeys, wherever these motorway structures and road structures t t hit communities, there was an incredible outpouring of energy, dark energy, and, and there's probably violence and crime and pollution, but also a very powerful creative energy. And these places became embraced by people who had to grow up under these structures and, and beca they became not romanticized, but part of their backdrop and as, as essential as any other, you know, picturesque element of, uh, of where we live and where we grow up and, and, and as cherished in their memories, really. I think it's fascinating and it's then so I think 
I, what was really interesting what you said there was like because sort of making the comparison with airports i guess that's another sort of term that has come up in different ways whether explicitly or implicitly this idea of sort of layering so like the thickness of motorways in terms of narratives but also layering in terms of your own journeys or like sort of retracing your steps or retracing the wheels of the car sort of going back over the same road again and again i think so it sort of seems to have emerged as, as a theme in the conversations both tonight and the conversations we've had before I'm sort of, I've got lots and lots more questions here that I could sort of throw in your direction and um, yeah, could go on all evening, but I'm also conscious that um, Richard wants to allow some time for sort of questions from sort of members of the audience. So Richard, I don't know whether that's a moment for you to sort of come back in with some of the questions that might have been posed. Yeah, thanks very much, David. Um, I kind of agree with you, like there's, there's questions pouring in, the chat's been really lively. Uh, I've got, I started writing questions, I've got loads myself, so uh, we, you know, we seem to have kind of uh, hit a bit of a thread here. This is the only talk uh, where I've actually had a question sent in before the event, uh, and someone has asked a similar question. Uh, they're both for Jen uh, in the chat, so I'll just combine those uh, to start with. Um, Shirley says, I've enjoyed looking at the work on your website, having tried to take photos of favourite motorway bridges myself, and invariably finding large lorries in the way. What preparation do you do for your paintings? How many times do you have to travel up and down a particular stretch? Or do you just go for bridges between two close junctions? And in relation to that, uh, Luke asks, assuming your photos are taken whilst moving, does this introduce a randomness in what you get to paint from? I mean, your chance to exa get exactly the photo you want is limited. And so do you then improvise to use the photo to recall a slightly different view or angle? Or do you paint what serendipity hands you? Rocky, okay. Um, so I I take, I hope most of the time, if, I've, if I'm with somebody and I'm on a motorway journey, um, I get them to take the photograph for me, a lot of them. Or if I'm passenger, I take the photographs. And like I said before, a lot of the time, there are lorries or yeah, cars and annoyingly in the way, there's traffic in the way. Um, I've painted a lot of, painted a lot of, I mean, I take a lot of photographs, a lot of them, and, I, and I've, I've painted a lot of motorways and I've painted a lot of bridges. And I think I've, you know, I think I, last year I painted about 50 new paintings. They were small, but, and they were all of motorway bridges and, and, and motorways. And I kind of, I've got to really know sort of the structure of a bridge and, and looking at really uh, looking at the photo and looking at different sort of viewpoints of the photo to get the structure of the bridge. And but I, you know, and I guess some of it is used, I, you know, use my own sort of in, in, interpretation if if my view is blocked by a vehicle. But um, you know, and I also think you know it's kind of when you're in a car and you're whizzing down a road, you, it's a it's a quick snapshot anyway, you know. And and detail is I, I like detail, but um, Sometimes you don't need all the detail, you need a suggestion of what's there. Um, so I look at a lot of photographs and, and then I, uh, I work from those basically. And I, you know, I use my own artistic, you know, uh, you know, to, 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 to make, make up the structure if I can't see it properly. <laughs> Expertise, I think, was the yeah, word. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's several questions uh, for both of you. Uh, well, I'll put this one to Gareth first. Uh, this is from David. Do you think there's a fundamental difference in character between linear motorways and orbital motorways? Oh, that's a good question. Um, uh, I Well, I mean, I guess maybe Ian Sinclair would be the best person to ask, answer the orbitals, but... Um, I think there are. I mean, effectively, there are a large roundabout. If you're looking at the, uh, if you're looking into the sort of the Stuart Silver's pagan interpretation of roundabouts and structures, it is a kind of a, I think that diverts power around the 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 the, the city or the town. Um, Ian Sinclair saw it as a river, uh, and effectively, the M25 has the character of a river uh, that kind of surrounds London. Um, whereas the other journeys tend to be. I mean, I guess when you're on the motorway, you're being filtered off on the M25, you're being filtered off to various places. Whereas in the M6, you're kind of on a journey going north. And I, I don't know whether it's just my, my interpretation of it, but when I'm on the M6, I feel like I'm climbing. 
you know, I think it's something to do with the mountains, but I feel genuinely like I'm going up the map, like, like up a roller coaster, yeah. which I don't feel like on the M25. The M25 is a sort of means to an end, um, unless, of course, you explore it as an object in itself, in which case it's, I'm sure it's fascinating. But the experience of driving, I would say the linear motorway, is, and especially ones that go cut, like the, M, the M1 and the M6 are very share their same qualities because they were the, the new North Roads and they were really important. They had folk, you know, uh, you, you and McColl did a folk song about the building of the M6 sorry, the M1. Um, and I think they had, they, there was much more of a, they were transformative, they were connecting parts of the country and they were, they were kind of revolutionary structures that did something culturally to the, to the I think, uh, that maybe the M25 or orbitals don't do. Jen? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I got a lot of experience of the, you know, the, the M6, as Gareth, you said, it's a, you know, straight road as, as opposed to um, the, M, the M25, which I did travel on a bit, and I, and I guess um, for me, looking at, at painting the roads and I like, I like to have, I don't really include too much of what's going on, you know, either side of the road. So it will be the trees and stuff. And I, and I guess for me, uh, I like the focus to be the road and the bridge. So uh, I tend to uh, focus more on the, the straight road, which will be cutting through more rural landscape as opposed to somewhere like the M25, which is obviously in a, in a more built up sort of, uh, landscape um, so I think they have their individual rent and um, you know assets but yeah for me the the straight road and like Gareth said going something about going from A to B in a straight line is slightly more sort of satisfying really um, than going round in circles. As an interesting nerdy point um, in the film with Nail and I they in order to they, obviously they travel up the M6 to Penrith but they what they did to create the kind of old oldie work you know a, a sort of late 60s motorway was they used the nascent m25 which hadn't quite opened yet so when you see this sort of sparse traffic and they sort of it, they created the m25 as disguised as an early m6 um and i think in one scene apparently you can see an actual sign that suggests it's the m6 as their m25 but yeah so maybe they're not so dissimilar brilliant thank you um craig asks uh, to both of you uh i wonder if you agree that literary and artistic interest in the so-called mundane aspects of the urban environment seems to have undergone something of a renaissance in recent years. And if so, do you have any thoughts as to why this might be? I, uh, for me, I think yeah. it's um, to do with um, th these places are becoming much more uh, where we live. And I think they're, like I said, they've grown older and these pe people have grown up in these environments and want to express where they live. And that happens to be, uh, suburbs and the kind of structures around these towns uh, I don't know whether you're in Andover or wherever you know it's just the roundabouts and dual carriageways and things of our lives and, and the car parks with, with, with our parents and these have become I think enough of us have had them in our lives now to I don't see why you shouldn't have a valid experience living in some kind of mundane British town as anywhere else and um, then you've got to look at things like uh, musically, like, I don't know, like, I think of like, artists like Burial and Fortet, who are all coming out of the suburbs and kind of making the sort of urban -y kind of music, but very grounded in it. I think uh, Bowie was as well. I think and punk was, they had a attachment to the suburbs. There's a sort of spirit of rebellion about it. And there's also a kind of, I think for me, it was a rebellion as in why not, why not embrace these places? Why can't these places be as fascinating as folkloric and as important as anywhere else? And why do we have this sort of hierarchy of the picturesque? Uh, why is one experience of Britain more authentic than another? Why should people have to travel away from where they live to go and have some kind of epiphany or experience? They don't have to wander the edge lands. You can just wander the underpass near the, the supermarket near your house and you'll find everything in the universe there. You know, all the elements of the universe are rippling through the underpass and there's art there and there's, there's danger there and there's everything you need. So that's kind of why I wanted to bring it back to those places. Yeah, and I think artists have, have all, you know, uh, through time kind of always uh, I've looked at the um, overlooked as it were and, and the, the things that in uh, the environment uh, urban landscape that, that people just walk by every day and um, artists are kind of look good at looking I think and finding and seeing beauty in, in the often overlooked and and I guess you know from my point of view I mean I didn't really realize that that you know when I started painting the motorways and the bridges what a Thing, a kind of a thing it was and how many people loved them and loved looking at them and um, which was quite surprising for me at the beginning and how many conversations I had with people about it and I kind of was, I was a bit like wow you know 
people like looking at these things and and so i guess yeah with you know artists and writers and stuff that can and po you know poets whether you know good at, good at looking at the overlook really yeah. yeah i think the popularity jen is to do with some of the stuff that uh, gareth was talking about about this kind of completely ubiquitous shared yeah. experience that actually you know you think this is an unusual subject but everybody yeah. has encountered it yeah, we all do it don't we you know we all get in the car and we all drive and you know, it's one of those everyday you know so, so potentially you know people have a love-hate relationship with it but i also think what's happened over the last year is you know we've had our freedom of movement taken away from us you know and i think people have really missed it and you know as much as they used to hate getting on the road and hate having to commute whatever you know, people were saying to me, God, I'd do anything to get on the M6 now and travel up north. I'd get anything to get on, on the motorway now and, and go to work and travel to work. I'm sick of sitting in my ha my kitchen in front of the computer. And, and I think that's people have really, the, the work's really resonated with people because of that, because they are missing it so much, you know? So, yeah. It, it was the same as I had with them. Um with car park life, you know, the, the supermarket car park, every, pretty much everyone, it's a great leveler and everyone has experience of it, yet there wasn't really much writing about it. There's, yeah. you know, there's, car, there's photographs of, of, of sort of multi-stories, but not the supermarket car park. It's not really, it's hard to define what they are or even take a picture of them. But everyone I talked to had a car park story, even if they were laughing at me at first, but eventually go, oh, well, there was that time and oh yeah, yeah. And there was, there was and when you Googled it, there was so many, so much drama, so many violent outbreaks, so many crimes, so many, you know, strange events happening in this thing but no one was really observing it it was like there's a blind spot right in the right where we spend most of our time was one of the most least written about parts of our landscape which i found well exciting for me because i could slip in there and write a book but it was kind of extraordinary really thank you um there's a couple of questions here that have i guess kind of similar possibilities so i'd like to pose them uh, both together to each of you um martin asks uh, motorways were once the dream of the future of adventure, escape, and endless possibility. What are they now? And uh, Cormac asks, uh, Jen and Gareth both spoke positively about nostalgia. Nostalgia is often now decried as a reactionary mode. How do you think nostalgia can be deployed creatively without becoming reactionary? So I guess they're both to do with sort of uh, perceptions and time. Gareth? <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, right. So motorways were a dream of the future. Yeah. And they, they were, and now what are they? They're problematic structures because the, of, of, of the dominance of the car and the problems that it's brought in terms of pollution and global warming. Uh, we have to renegotiate our relationship with this. It wasn't this endless possibility. It's the same with multi-story car parks and these structures that are kind of dying off now because you, know, you can't park in the center of town anymore. And the, the, the Welbeck in the middle of London, that's a great big sort of multi-story car park that was people were trying to save it because it was so picturesque, but basically no one was parking in the middle of London. So these things are going to come like sort of worn down and ruined. There's something about a, a death of a dream about them. Uh, and I think the, the more you build, the more they fill up. So I think I think we realised that they weren't the great solution they they thought they thought they were. Um, as for nostalgia, um, I'm anti nostalgia really in the sense that I try and disrupt it, and I don't really believe in this kind of house. The whole whole unofficial Britain was written to get rid of this sort of nostalgia for a time that none of us lived in that we all thought was better. The Second World War, Victorian era, the kind of the merry old England of folklore. I just, I just don't buy it, and I wanted to re, re bring that back into the contemporary world and say, no, it, everything is as valid in your experience now. There's so many, so many stories, and there's just so much from rich, so much rich tapestries in life, and they, even if it's a shopping center. However, I do use nostalgia in the sense that I think how we remember our past is very important. So when it comes to personal nostalgia, in the sense that understanding the difference between the past and the present, and also realize the importance of memory place is memory uh, it's very hard to un you can't really separate the two um, and so you have to kind of talk about nostalgia when you talk about place and you just don't have to treat it as some hallowed thing that can't be undermined or something that has a political agenda Jen yeah I, I, I mean I agree that nostalgia um well I, I mean I said this before it's it, it's really important part of, of, of my work and people connecting to my work but um you know and memory and people not forgetting their past and connecting to their past but you know i you know i agree with everything gareth just said but it, yeah it's it's a major it's an important you know connection that people make with, with regards to my work and um and about you know it connects people to places and and you know and they they see their sort of 
they see their past when they look, look at the roads and look at the motorways. They see so many different um, times in their past that bring up all the memories and, 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 and they think about relationships and, um, you know, I, yeah, I, I think it's, for me, it's, a, it's an important part of my, of, my, of my work and my practice currently to do with, to, you know, painting the roads and the motorways. Great, thank you. Um, I've got one final question and it's quite short and, and light and there may be a one word answer uh, and then we'll close. And it's to Jen uh, from Martin. Jen, do all motorways lead to paintings or just some? <laughs> uh, just some, not all of them. There you go. <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much. Um, with that then, I think uh, it's a really good time to draw things to a close because uh, I've been told by uh, my colleagues that we should stop with people wanting more and there's quite clearly kind of masses to be uh, discussed here. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, everyone who's attended. Uh, I'd really like to thank uh, yourselves, uh, Jen and Gareth and David for uh, preparing and talking and, and kind of bringing this thing together. Uh, I'd love to thank uh, Lutza, my colleague uh, with whom I work, uh, Jack and Eddie uh, and Ashir and Sarah at the Modernist Society and uh, the HRC for uh, giving us the funds to be able to do this. Um, we will be editing and publishing all the videos online. So everyone who's attended, uh, will be, you'll be able to kind of reflect uh, on this conversation. And I'm very willing uh, to hear views from anyone who's attended if you want to sort of share thoughts uh, with myself, uh, please uh, just uh, send me an email. So uh, thank you, everybody, and uh, thank you. good night. Thank you.